This unbiased review is made possible by KEH. KEH is the world's greatest store for buying and selling used camera gear, cameras, lenses, tripods, everything. Start at this link. And if you want a 5% discount, use our coupon code here. Thanks for sponsoring us, KEH. This is the Sony 24-50 F2.8G. A really common focal length with a fast f-stop but not the full heavy professional grade 24 to 70 f2.8 that we're all used to. This seems like the perfect travel lens and I've spent the last several days here in Puerto Rico trying it out in every different situation that I can think of and it's performing amazingly but it does have a few drawbacks. I'm going to cover the contrast, the sharpness, the usability of it, whether you might want to consider that Tamron 20 millimeter zoom lens instead. But first I do want to discuss one little problem I'm having. It's very humid here and the lens was resting inside in an air conditioned environment. So you'd expect to get some fog on the front and rear elements. But I was a little surprised to find out that I was actually getting fog on the internal elements which uh, that can definitely happen, but it's less likely to happen on the professional lenses that are better sealed and don't have external zooming like this, like my 24 to 70 F2.8 G Master. So it's not infallible, and that might be one reason to upgrade to the pro lens. Times like now when we get a sudden thunderstorm with a professional grit lens, like one of the GM lenses, I could probably keep shooting. But with this lens, well, I'm having to switch to my phone, which you can already see is getting covered in rain just because my phone is completely waterproof. Look, I've never let imperfect weather sealing stop me from going out and getting the shot. A few drops get on it, you wipe them away, and generally everything is fine. This lens has an aperture ring on the dial like all the recent Sony lenses, but it's so nice because when my left hand is on it, I can really quickly click over to f2.8 to get a portrait of Chelsea with a little bit of background blur. Or if it's a landscape shot and I want deeper depth of field, I just click it right over to f11 and it happens automatically. The 24 to 50 range feels pretty limiting. Like we're used to two and a half, three, four time zoom lenses, but Sony lent me this SA7CR, which is a super compact 60 megapixel full frame camera. And that gives me a ton of croppability. So I could easily crop to 70 millimeters. Even if I crop to 100 millimeters, I still have 15 megapixels of detail. So still pretty usable cropped two times. And for those times when I want to go wider, I turn the camera vertically like this and take several shots and then stitch them together in a panorama. It doesn't work for video, but for stills, you can get the results you want with just a few clicks. And as a result, I feel like this is maybe the most versatile travel combination you can get if you're like me and you're obsessed with high quality. Back in the mainland with a little bit of a tan, let's talk about lenses that most closely compete with this new 24 to 50 f2.8. My day-to-day -day lens, it, because I'm a professional, I tend to use the G Master lenses. And you can see the 24 to 70 G Master 2 here and this pretty huge size and weight difference. And I'll say hiking up those mountains at El Yunque, I am really glad I was bringing this instead of this. In that travel and landscape focus scenario, I never found myself missing the 50 to 70 millimeter range that this offers, but I actually wish I could go a little bit wider on this 24 to 50 and I did shoot a lot of panoramas as a result. That's a good workaround with landscapes, but still, it would be really nice if I had the option to zoom a little wider. For myself when buying a travel lens, I would strongly consider the Tamron 20 to 40 f2.8. KEH has some of these for about 30% less than you'll be able to buy this new. That's a pretty good deal, and I think you'll end up using that 20 to 24 range a lot, especially if you shoot any video because the Sony cameras offer some active stabilization that tends to crop in. And so that extra 20 to 24 millimeter range, I think you're gonna use a lot. But take a look at your own photo album and decide whether you'd rather go a little more tele photo or a little bit wider. For the $1,100 price tag here, you could also pick up lenses like the Sigma F2.8 Art lens for Sony. If you find one of these at KEH, grab it really quick because they tend to sell out. At about the same price point, about $1,100, I see that KEH has the original 24 to 70 F2.8 GM lens, not the Mark II, but the first one. That is the power of buying used from a place like KEH. Sometimes you can get a little bit more for your money, but it's bigger 
And while I haven't compared it side by side with this new lens, it's not as sharp as this Mark II version of the GM24-70 f2.8. Because my daily shooter is the 24-70 f2.8 GM Mark II, I did all my side by side comparisons against this. So first, let's take a look at how this compared in sharpness to a lens twice as expensive. At 24 millimeters, the first thing I notice is the new 24 to 50 is actually a little wider. Look at the space to the left of my dad and to the right of the transformer cannon. But I also see more distortion here. This desk here is a little bit curved on the new lens while it's pretty straight on the GM lens. This distortion would probably be removed once we have Lightroom profiles that we can apply to the lens. But it's worth noting that I haven't applied profiles to either just so they're on more equal footing. Optically, the GM lens has less distortion. Zoom in to check the sharpness. This is amazing, but I'm going to say they're about equal. At half the price, the 24 to 50 seems about the same sharpness in the center at 24 millimeters. But let's check the corners. At the edges of the frame, the G Master lens at 24 millimeters looks way better. So doubling the price does get you corner to corner sharpness. How about 50 millimeters? Whoa, at 50 millimeters, the G Master shows you why it costs twice as much. This is crazy amounts of detail. Of course, I'm shooting this at 240 megapixels, so you'll see a less of a difference when you're not using pixel shift on a tripod, but still, this difference is crazy. Let's check the edge of the frame. Near the edges of the frame, they're both showing a lot of chromatic aberration, the magenta here and the green here. And the G Master lens definitely loses some detail at the edge, but still looks better than the G lens. What about those times when you need 70 millimeters and we have to crop on the 24 to 50? Let's see how the detail compares between cropping to 70 and zooming to 70. Because the 24 to 50 was already a little bit weaker at the 50 millimeter end, the cropping really doesn't hold up though I bet this is enough detail for most people, especially when using a 60 megapixel camera like the a7C R. That's pretty telling. You pay twice as much, you get sharper images, more so at the long end. So if you're working more on the wide end here, I'd be totally happy with this. That's also all at 240 megapixels. So if you're at 60 megapixels or 24 megapixels with something like a Sony a7C, most of those differences are going to pretty much disappear. Next, I went into the studio environment and shot backlit portraits. This creates flaring and chromatic aberration, technically challenging scenarios that can ruin your image quality if a lens is less than perfect. So let's see how this lens handled. First, at 24 millimeters, the G Master lens actually has more flaring. Look at this blob here. Let's zoom in to check the chromatic aberration. The chromatic aberration is a little different, but I think it's about equal. As we peer into the unlit foreground, I'm looking for the amount of contrast and detail. And to me, the G Master looks a little bit more contrasty. So the G Master had a little more flaring, but a little better contrast, and I'm going to call it a tie. At 50 millimeters, again, I see a little more flaring from the G Master. Pretty similar chromatic aberration, though here the G lens is a little bit worse. And again, a little more contrast and detail from the G Master lens. Actually, I was really impressed with those results. And I would consider those professional level results. And I would not hesitate to shoot backlit portraits with this, which I would with a lens like the 24 to 105 F4G. Next, I took the lens outside and shot directly into the sun with a high F stop. See how they each rendered starbursts. That's a common technique for landscape and travel photography. I'm shooting an F22 to turn the sun into a starburst. Each aperture blade creates two points, and they both have the same number of points, indicating that they both have 11 bladed apertures. Note that the starburst on the G Master lens is a little bit cleaner, supporting the idea that it has slightly better contrast. I do see a little bit more flaring on the G Master, though. You can see there just seems to be a little bit less of it here. Note that these green and magenta blobs here occur on both, and they're not the fault of the lenses, but rather the sensors. Sony sensors reflect light off of the on-sensor autofocus points, and it creates a sort of ugly effect when you shoot into the sun, especially with high f-stops. At 50 millimeters, the results, again, they're pretty similar. The G Master lens is a little bit cleaner, showing better contrast, but a little bit more flaring. So should you pick up the Sony 24 to 50 F2.8? Hopefully I've helped you decide whether it's the right lens for you. 
For myself, I think I'd be a little more impressed by the Tamron 20 to 40. I'd like that focal range a little more for things like landscapes or travels through narrow European streets. And then for things like weddings and events, professional stuff, I would use my Sony GM Mark II lens. Whichever you decide, be sure to use our links and shop at KEH before you buy anything. Check them out and see if they have any of these available used because you can get a lower price, especially if you use our coupon code, and they'll still give you a warranty. There's a 21 day return period if you don't like it for any reason. And if you have leftover gear, you can sell it to KEH and they'll give you cash back that you can then spend on other things. KEH makes it possible for us to spend a week doing detailed testing like this and give you an unbiased review. We've never accepted a sponsorship from Sony or any other camera or lens manufacturers. That's why we consider ourselves to be unbiased. Also, if sunny and actually rarely rainy Puerto Rico sounds good to you, check out prphotoadventures.com. That's Jaime. He follows us too, and he offered to give us a tour of the island for free, but he is a professional tour guide. So if you want to visit some of those same spots and see the very best Puerto Rico has to offer, check them out. And we even have a 10% coupon code for you to use. Thank you, Jaime. Thank you, KEH. And thank you for watching. Be sure to subscribe to see more free reviews, tutorials, and live photo reviews of your photos every Thursday at five o'clock. Bye.